We're here with Shane Beamer, South Carolina head coach, uh, as we continue to talk to first year head coaches across the country. Uh, Shane, um, your name uh, almost immediately came up when that South Carolina job came open because of all the respect former players and, and people had there for you in Columbia. When, when that job came open, what was it like in those days leading up to when you finally got the job? It was a long process. Uh, I mean, I think it was around two and a half weeks, uh, maybe three from the time that, uh, the change was made until the time I got hired. So it was a it was a stressful time waiting. I mean, I felt pretty good about where I stood in, in, in the search. We did a phone interview, I think, a couple of days after the job came open, and I thought that re went really well. I interviewed in person a week and a half later, uh, but it was – it was not uh, just a quick slam dunk. I mean, it was a process, but, you know, felt pretty good about it all along. I was busy coaching my own team at Oklahoma. We were trying to win another Big 12 championship, so I was busy with that. But it was certainly a lot going on uh, at one time, but uh, thankful that it turned out the way that it did in the end. You win that Big 12 title, and I think you uh, got on social media and did some video going, hey, you want to win a championship? This is what it's like. Well, was that immediately in your head, like, I'm going to do this, or was that – before the game, like if we're going to win, I'm going to, I think I'm going to do this. No, I wish I could take credit for it. Uh, we've got a fantastic creative design team here at South Carolina. So they had, they had reached out to me that week to say, Hey, if you win, would you mind doing this? And I'm like, no, <laughs> heck no. It's a great idea. I hope we can. So I, I didn't have my own phone. It wasn't like I carried my phone on the sidelines during I was the game. Say. I had to, we were celebrating. I mean, we were celebrating and, and it's, it's such an emotional, there's the emotion of winning a big 12 championship. There's the emotion of the excitement that you're now headed to South Carolina as the head coach. There's the sadness that you're leaving a place that you love and coaches and players. So it was a, a whirlwind of emotions that day, but I had to grab, uh, I grabbed, I think it was our assistant strength coach's phone. Uh, he did have one on him and uh, I just took the phone and did the video real quick and then uh, went back to celebrating. Um, so when you get, when you get to South Carolina, obviously you're no stranger to the, to the area. What are some of the first things that, that popped out to you, but also, you know, being a first time head coach, but you've been around head coaches all your life, including your father, that there's some things you've learned from all of them, Lincoln Riley included to kind of get things started. But what's one of the first things you got to do when you get your feet on the ground? It's so much. I mean, it, that, and that was I talked to a lot of head coaches. I've, I've been around some great head coaches, like you said, uh, but Bob Stoops and Lincoln Riley, both, they, they told me the exact same thing. They're like, look, you, there's so much you have to do, but you, you can't do it all in one day. You can't do it all in one week. You just got to prioritize kind of each day. These are the things that are most important. Uh, so I came over here. If you remember, South Carolina played Kentucky, Oklahoma played Baylor. It was announced that night that I was going to be the new head coach at South Carolina. So I, I came over here on that Sunday, uh, Sunday morning I was, I was here, or Sunday around lunchtime I was here, immediately met with the current staff that was already in place just to kind of talk about where we were going forward, where they were, my plans for them. I met with the current team that afternoon and then – kind of got a general idea of the roster and where we were from a recruiting standpoint and a current roster here on the team. Um, and then went back, won the Big 12, like you said, and then the very next day you came back and our, the players were, at that time, South Carolina was practicing for a bowl game. Mm -hmm. So I got here that Sunday. I actually, I watched them practice on that Sunday night. Monday, it was decided they weren't going to play in the bowl game. And um, really at that point, it's just kind of your current roster, trying to keep the team out of the portal um trying to figure out who you're going to add to your roster through recruiting and just a general idea of the roster and then you know things that jumped out obviously I don't know the last time you were in Columbia but where I'm doing this interview is a fantastic football facility that we built that was not here when I was here before that's as good as anywhere in the country when you talk about how nice it is the size uh the way that it's built the practice fields right outside indoor facility connected to it. I mean, it's amazing. So that, that jumped out immediately. That was not here when I was here before that we're excited to have now. And you can go record, record an album in there too. I hear yeah, the, the Darius Rucker recording studio. So 
Uh, Melvin Ingram, a former great player here, yeah. um, that's with uh, the Chargers right now. He was here a couple weeks, a few weeks ago, and he loves. Uh, you know, recording music and involved in that. So he was like a little kid when he came in there and, and uh, saw that. So it's certainly pretty cool as a uh, as a music fan to be able to have talked to Darius Rucker a couple of times on the cell phone and and then also be able to go downstairs and our players be able to utilize the Darius Rucker recording studio for sure. So um, as a first time head coach, you've obviously have learned things and picked things up uh, along the way from a bunch of head coaches. Um, what, what is like maybe one or two things you mentioned talking about prioritizing things, but things that they, they told you about that you knew about going into a job, but that, but still maybe surprised you a little bit or, or did anything surprise you when you got on, got on um... the ground? I don't think it was anything. I mean, you kind of knew and, and they gave me some advice. Uh, a lot of them all said, just prioritize. Like you said, the one thing that a lot of them, Coach Stoops told me this, um, quite a few was just take your time on putting your staff together. Like everybody wants to know who your 10 coaches are going to be like immediately. And it's not that simple. Um, so they all said, take your time, don't rush, because you only have one time to get that right, your very first staff. And that's more important than anything you do. And I tried to do that uh, to the best of my abilities. And, and probably the biggest surprise, I really hadn't had to deal with uh, assistant coaches' salaries as an assistant coach other than my own <laughs> and, and buyouts. And every university handles contract buyouts with assistant coaches differently. And um, I came from a place where at Oklahoma and even at Georgia, where if I had left those programs to go to another school as an assistant coach, the buyout was very, very minimal. And it was a little bit of a surprise just because I hadn't dealt with it and I didn't anticipate it, just to be totally honest, the size of some of the buyouts for assistant coaches. I mean, I talked to, you know, um, assistant coaches, strength coaches. I mean, I interviewed a lot of people and talked to a lot of people and dealt with a range of buyouts from no buyout to $900,000 if a guy wanted to leave a place to go to another school. So that was a little bit something maybe I didn't anticipate uh, going into it. Just the, you knew with the coordinators and some of the high profile coordinators that a lot of those guys would have it, but strength coaches with $300,000 buyouts and things like that, that I did not anticipate that. So that was a learning experience for sure. But, you know, we made it through and in the end got it where it needed to be. You know what it's like to be a CEO, I, I guess now, but big I literally, as well. I felt like that's what I felt like for the first month, like the scene in, uh, in Jerry Maguire where Tom Cruise is just in the office on his cell phone back and forth. That was me uh, for literally the month, just talking about, you know, uh, uh, negotiating uh, buyouts and, and contracts. And we hired Justin Stepp from, you know, right there in Fayetteville, Arkansas, where you are. And, and I mean, Justin just kind of working through his buyout and stuff like that. It was certainly, uh, I had to tell some of these guys, look, there's some people that are a whole lot smarter than I am when it comes to like finances and things like that. We'll let them deal with it and go from there. But that was a, uh, definitely learned a lot during that experience. So um, I, I wanted to, I read a, read a couple of quotes from you that were really kind of eye-opening to me and it really kind of uh, stuck with me about how uh, you and a lot of your staff members are kind of like, you've gone into this with a chip on your shoulder. You guys all feel like you have so much to prove. And, and for you, I mean, listen, uh, a coach's son is always connected to his, his father. And uh, for you, you know, fair or unfair and probably more unfair obviously you know people are going well you know Shane Beamer got around in this business because of his father which is not true but you hear that stuff what's that like and is that part of what kind of motivates you yeah um you know when I was in high school whether I was playing left field on the Blacksburg high school baseball team or whether I was playing high school football, whether it was real or not. I mean, I heard it that the only reason he's the starting left fielder is because his dad's the football coach across town at Virginia tech and same thing with football and all that. Um, when I got into college, it was, well, the only reason he's playing football at Virginia tech is because his dad's the coach. And then when that was a big reason when I finished up, 
uh, playing at Virginia Tech, I did not want to stay and be a graduate assistant for my dad. And, and no disrespect to any son of a coach that's only worked for his dad, but I didn't want to do that. I wanted to, I wanted to go out and make my own name and kind of establish my own credibility, contacts, whatever, and not have anybody say that the only reason I was in coaching was because my dad was the coach. And, and you know this, Brandon, like I'm not naive. I, I understand my last name helped me get hired as a graduate assistant at Virginia Tech. I mean, my dad had worked with Ralph Friedgen before at a couple of different places, the offensive coordinator at Georgia Tech at that time. The athletic director was Dave Brain. He had been the athletic director at Virginia Tech. That helped me get my foot in the door. But as you know, you've got to keep yourself there. And your, your last name's not going to keep you in the business if you're not going to be good. So I just worked really hard to overcome any uh, perceptions of that. And I was gone, I think, 11 years before I went back to Virginia Tech to coach with my dad. But no, even still to this day, um, whether it's real or not, I'd use that edge, chip on your shoulder, hungry mentality, whatever you want to call it. And and I'm a self-starter. I don't need that to motivate me. I don't need somebody saying, well, uh, Shane's not going to be able to get the job in at South Carolina to motivate me. I'm, I'm self-motivated to begin with. But certainly, um, you've got a lot of guys that are in this building on this staff that are that are hungry. I mean, don't get me wrong. We, we've got some fantastic coaches in here. We've got guys that have coached in the SEC. Uh, we've got guys that have been head coaches, but then we also got some guys that are coaching in the SEC for the first time, but are fantastic coaches that may not be household names right now, but will be. I mean, I use Clayton White, our defensive coordinator, for example. I mean, Clayton had coached at NC State. His track record at Western Kentucky speaks for itself. When we hired him, he had another Power Five team trying to hire him as his defensive co as their defensive coordinator. He got the job here, and 24 hours later let's just say a top 20 program regularly in college football called him about wanting to be the defensive coordinator at their place. And he's like, wait, wait a minute. now, Y'all had this opening 72 hours ago. I guess I wasn't good enough when I was at Western Kentucky, but now all of a sudden that I am. And um, I think we got quite a few guys like that and I'm excited they're here with me and have the same mentality that I do. And, but more importantly, just hungry and we've got a bunch of competitors uh, on this staff that believe in this place and, and, and truly feel like I do that there's no reason why we can't win and win big here at Carolina. Well, what's with you hiring people and then other schools just wanting to take them off? I mean, goodness <laughs> gracious, you dealt a lot with that in your first few weeks on the job. And yeah. now I hear about Clayton. Yeah, I, uh, I probably need to be politically correct on that one and just, uh, you know, hopefully it shows that I knew what the heck I was doing early on and the people that I hired. You got to have backups for the backups for the backups. You got to always have a list, man. And, and but you made hot, you made hires quickly after that. After that, yeah. After those guys and you know work. this, like I've been, I've been preparing for a long time to be a head coach, and and you're always thinking about guys. Okay, I'm the assistant coach at Oklahoma, and I get the opportunity to be a head coach at a at a group of five job, or an, you get an opportunity to be a coach at a power five job. And, and every place is different. Like all the pieces have to fit geographically, everything. Uh, but when I interviewed for this job, you know, presented my ideas for the staff. And just like you said, at every position, I had kind of had like one, two, and three. These are the, you know, the three guys at each position that I'd like to talk to. And, and for the most part, you know, guys that were on that initial list uh, are on this staff with me right now. I had another head coach tell me that the the hardest the hardest two months for a head coach in the entire year are December and January, just because you don't know what's going on with your staff and you've kind of just constantly got to be on your toes and be flexible. And, and uh, uh, you know, we had some guys on this staff that had opportunities to go other places and stayed. And then we also had some guys on this staff and support staff that stayed. And then we had some guys, like I said, that, that chose to move on and wish them well. But uh, in the end, I really feel like this thing – ended the way the exactly the way it should be i couldn't be more excited about the group that's here with me so tell me about the roster you inherited and then also some of the guys you you tried to bring in you know <clears throat> in your first couple of months there as you head into the spring practice who are some guys i mean that you're trying to lean on right now to help get this thing going to get them believing in everything to kind of set the foundation yeah, it's a good group. I mean, there were a lot of these guys that I was familiar with because either when I was at Georgia with Kirby Smart or Oklahoma with Lincoln Riley, we were trying to recruit some of these guys to those schools. So I had some familiarity 
with some of those guys, particularly on defense, Jordan Birch, Alex Huntley, Zach Pickens, a lot of guys, Rick Sandage that we try to recruit at those schools, uh, Jaheim Bell on offense, uh, was familiar with Luke Doty just throughout the recruiting process, Marshawn Lloyd. I'd always recruited the East Coast when I was at Oklahoma. So I knew a lot, knew about a lot of these guys already, which was good. So that's helped. And, and uh, really just trying to bring along everybody and, and develop leadership on the team. And, and, you know, you can watch them in the weight room and things like that, but until you get on the field with them and actually practice, it's hard to kind of see what you have. So we're just trying to, the biggest thing priority for us was just attacking the weight room. Coach Muschamp last year made a change at strength coach. So from, you know, they, they, high, they were in year one of a new strength coach last season. And then with COVID, they really didn't get a off season program with their new strength coach at all. And then the season was different. So we needed to just get in the weight room and just live in the weight room. And that's pretty much all the hours that the NCAA allots us uh, during the off season until literally this week, they've all been devoted to the weight room because we need all that we can get. And, um, and really just trying to, to develop leadership and, We've got some depth issues, just to be totally frank. I mean, we've since I've taken the job, there's five defensive backs that aren't here anymore, either transfer portal or left early for the NFL draft. And that's five at one position, good players. And and then we've got a couple of injuries at that position. So we're sitting here getting ready to go into spring practice. And we, we got a severe, you know, some issues at defensive back just with spring practice, for example, that we've tried to recruit our way out of. And a lot of those guys are here now. A lot of those guys will be here in the fall. We're, you know, we're continue to, continuing to build that thing. But I couldn't be more excited about the, the mentality of the players in this building right now. It's a fresh start for all of them, the energy, the excitement. We just got to keep, uh, keep uh, building on that and, and, and have put good days on top of good days. You know, it's proven you can win at South Carolina. We've seen South Carolina in the SEC championship game. I mean, goodness gracious, you've had, you know, two uh, legends be the head coaches there and Lou Holtz and Steve Spurrier, and they really kind of helped lift the, the program into that contention of, hey, this is a team that could potentially, you know, challenge in the SEC East. But it's been, it's been a little bit. It's been, it's been more difficult. Can you get Carolina back there? And what is it going to take to, to get back to that level? I believe so. I've told the players this and I mean it. Like I look around and I don't know what we need here to be successful that we don't have. I mean, this football facility is premier. The You've been in williams Bryce Stadium. The atmosphere in that stadium on a Saturday is as good as anywhere in the country. And that's not just when – the big teams come to town. I mean, that's every single Saturday, regardless of who the opponent is. It's a passionate, hungry fan base. We've got a fantastic university with, with elite academics here. Columbia is an amazing city to live in. We're close to the beach. We're two hours from the Atlantic Ocean. We're a couple hours from the mountains. Charlotte's 90 minutes up the road. Atlanta's close. So you've got a recruiting base. And um, obviously, you're playing in the toughest conference in America. So the competition is, is severe. Uh, uh, our rival up the road is, is rolling at a pretty good level to say the least. So there's a lot of uh, challenges, but as a competitor, you want that. And you know this from covering football, college football for so long. If you're at the top of the SEC, you're going to be in the college football playoff hunt, national hunt every year. So to me, it's just recruiting. And when we, when we did that before, um, when I was here before, it was, it was those in-state players and recruit. Did I lose you? I can still hear you. Your, your picture went away. There sorry. you go. Oh, yeah, that's all right. Do I need to start you, go. Up you got me? Good. I think we can edit that in. That can okay. switch to me and then yeah. we'll switch back to you. Yeah, I was just going to say it was, it was, we recruited our way out of it. And, and we've got, uh, before it was keeping those great players in South Carolina at home. It was, it was Alshon Jeffrey could have gone anywhere in the country, was yeah. committed to Southern Cal, decided to stay and come to South Carolina and do something that's never been done before. The same year with Stefan Gilmore. Then the next year, uh, Marcus Lattimore comes along and Alshon stayed in state the year before with, with Stefan, I can do this. And then the next year it was Jadavion Clowney. And then when you keep those guys at home, but then you're also able to add a Melvin Ingram from North Carolina, a Connor Shaw from Georgia, a Steven Garcia from Florida. We've got a great recruiting base around us. And I'm excited because the resources in place here now are so much better than what they were 10 years ago when I was here. And, and uh, that certainly gives you a starting point. 
Well, I wanted to just quickly end with this as a bigger picture thing that everybody's going to be dealing with soon with name, image, and likeness. And you talk about recruiting. It's the lifeblood of every program. I mean, how are you preparing mentally for this? Because you've got coaches that are like talking to lawyers. Like, how do I, how are we going to navigate this? How do I even understand it when we're talking to, to players when they come on board? How are you preparing for that? Yeah, great question. Just just that, trying to educate myself. And, and obviously there's different uh, legislation throughout Congress, you know, in regards to exactly what it may look like. There's different uh, congressmen, senators that have different bills that they're pushing. So exactly how it looks is still a, a lot up in the air. Uh, the gist of it's pretty cut and dry. So trying to educate myself as much as we can and, and understand that it's that it's coming and that it's going to be a change and trying to prepare ourselves the best we can for it, whether it be with uh, uh, staffing, resources, the logistics of it. We're trying to prepare and do all that daily uh, for that as well. And, and I think that's an advantage about South Carolina too. The fact that we, we are in the capital city of South Carolina, it's not a big city where there's a hundred different things going on for people. You know, here in Columbia, South Carolina, it's the capital and everything is geared towards Carolina athletics. And that opens up so many opportunities for our guys from a, NIL standpoint uh, throughout this town and throughout this state and throughout this region. So we'll be well positioned when it happens. And in the meantime, we're just trying to take the steps each day to prepare ourselves for that. I said, as a last question, I got another one that's for something I'm working on later down the road uh, about OU actually, but you know, I, I, I think personally that they're going to be a playoff contender next year. And obviously you were inside that program. What, what do you think they're capable of? next season uh not just in the big 12 but can they make that that breakthrough and maybe win yeah. a game and get to the national championship yeah i do i mean you know you've got to be uh strong at quarterback and and they will be uh spencer got spencer rattler got better as the year went on uh and was playing some really good football by the end of the season um, defensively, Alex Grinch and his staff have done a great job of improving the talent on that side of the ball where now you can, you can win games at Oklahoma like we did in the Big 12 Championship, but we didn't play very good at all on offense, but our defense played lights out and got some turnovers. And, and Lincoln's so good as a play caller that if you just can get a couple turnovers and, and give him a couple extra possessions, it's over. And we've got Oklahoma has a defense now that can do that really good up front. Some of the guys that are coming back defensively uh, that can affect the quarterback. And I just think the confidence that uh, that team gained by winning the Cotton Bowl like they did and then winning another Big 12 championship certainly sets them up for it. But uh, every year is different. And there's it's such a thin line between winning and losing. You know, you've got everybody in that conference that's that the best game of the year for them or the, the game that every team in that conference gets up for probably more than any other is Oklahoma because Oklahoma's won it what, six years in a row. So you're getting everybody's best shot and, and then everything's just got to come together leadership wise. And, and it doesn't just happen. I mean, it's the work ethic throughout the off season and, and uh, all that's got to come together the springtime, the summer, this time of year, but certainly the pieces are in place. And, and I know those guys are excited about, uh, Excited about 2000, uh, 2021 for sure. You almost forgot the year. I do the same thing now. Uh, 2020 <laughs> was <minute>. weird. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a minute. Well, Shane, hey, man, I appreciate you uh, taking the time out to do this. I know you're really busy. When, when spring ball start for you guys, by the we way? We start March, uh, March 20th. Uh, okay. So um, here in a few weeks. So excited to get out there on the field and, and um, get, get to work. Yeah, uh, I hope I'm hoping to hit the road for some stuff, and uh, I don't I don't know if I'll be able to stop by there, but I'm looking forward to to seeing everything up close there in person. I haven't seen the new facility yet either, and okay, I hear yeah, great things. I say it's awesome, it's awesome. So you gotta put us on your list, and let's make it happen. I will, man. All right, Shane, I'll, I'll let you go, man. I really appreciate the time. Good luck this spring, and uh, and uh, congratulations. You bet. Thanks a lot, Brandon. Appreciate you having All me. Right. On.